Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com, the All Media Reviews podcast number five. I believe five have already been made. doesn't seem like it. But, uh, yeah, so this is going to be uh, at least one part, maybe the only part at this point. And I think likely to be just the first quarter, per se, and beyond uh, of a series of podcasts I want to make. I've made the preview videos for the upcoming uh music and albums release season that kind of thing in the past um and so that's but i meant to make them in quarters i usually just make one and then i never get around to making a second or third maybe i'll do a i do a mid-year i've done mid-year videos but um if i have the time and the, uh, the ability to do it i will try to make these maybe at least by quarter at least not at least at least do another one maybe doing um like four of these throughout from now until I don't know. I guess the last quarter would beginning it would begin October, September, uh, August, probably at the end of July of 2018. But we'll see. So I may as well just get into it. I've been updating my anticipation entry, and a lot of uh, the stuff is sort of a filter of what I, I actually main, have been maintained the last couple of years on the Dream Theater forums of releases. But of course, on my list, the the year and the calendar starts. November 1st, so I'll go over it. November 17th, with stuff that's already come out, Galactic Cowboys released Long Way Back to the Moon, the first album from the Galactic Cowboys in 17 years, approximately. And I I have videos, I have the vinyl, I can show that, I, I mean to show that. I, I may upload that the video that I made that showed that, but otherwise I, I'd like to do an actual separate either podcast or video about Galactic, about Galactic Cowboys. I did an l- entry many years back talking about my love for them. But um, they're sort of uh, <laughs> Metallica meets... What was the deal? It was Metallica meets Rush, or not exactly. Um, meets the Beatles, rather. Um, Beatles meets Metallica. Sort of like Beatallica <laughs> writing original music or vice versa. Beatallica's really like the Galactic Cowboys doing covers, but... Um, yeah, this is this is a really good record. Uh, one of my favorites for sure already this year. Uh, the early singles have been there were like two singles they shared. I don't know as, back, as far back as like maybe August or September, but um, this is with original guitarist Dane Sonnier also, which he was on the first two Galactic Cowboys albums in the early '90s and then ended up leaving the band. They had another guitarist, Wally Farkas, join. Which the band was still good then, but um, it is interesting to hear uh, the the band come back with with maybe more a lot of that original the first two albums sound um, largely because of Dane. So anyway, um, yeah, I guess I'll do is maybe do a separate entry about that album at some point or do a special on them. But yeah, I like Long Way Back to the Moon. They have a song called Zombies, which is catching on and. Um, I don't have the track list in front of me. I suppose I could just pull it up real quickly. Just because I'm not sure if I want to do a lot of commentaries and reviews on these albums that have already come out, necessarily. But, um, because the the, the length of this will end up getting to be that long. But (laughs) let's just see if I can... I mean, I, 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 the truth is I have not listened to this as much as I mean to, meant to. I've been uh, doing other things, working on other things, listening to other things at work so i probably only listened to the whole thing a couple like two times so far but i'm going to listen to it more i already know it's a record that is going to be on my end of your list and um let's see here where is it i can't believe i can't find this um but i mean just to just to name specifics about it let's see where is it galactic right there in the clouds internal masquerade internal masquerade was the first single um uh, and it's like three bonus tracks. So, I mean, I don't think I even got to the last one. Say goodbye to... Is it Say Goodbye to the Moon? Say goodbye to... To Utopia, rather. Um, but, yeah, this is... It's their crazy kind of... They have the crazy harmonies and the heavy riffs and the bass lines. And the production is definitely modern production. And you can hear <coughs> a difference between this and even their last album, Let It Go, back in 2000. So... Anyway, that's all that I've really noted on for November, which may stuff may pop up that I didn't know about from now till the end of the year. But anyway, December we had 
was it four releases that came out on December 1st. The Deer Hunters All Is As All Should Be EP. The Faceless In Becoming a Ghost. Uh, I just found about out about, and I'm going to be checking it out soon, the Nicholas Krigovich album In an Open Field, which is, he put out an album a couple years ago. I never got around to checking it out, and then the album I first got into him was in 2014. So he's pretty prolific. But his stuff kind of goes under the radar. He's kind of a singer-songwriter, but uses piano at points. Um, anyway, and then uh, U2's Songs of Experience also came out on December 1st. So among all those, Deer Hunter EP, I like, I'm like. i liking more and more as I'm he- hearing it. The first, the last three songs specifically, Witness, someone mentioned that it reminds them of the, the end of it reminds them of the Stranger Things theme, which uh, I can kind of hear that, the sort of ambient, sort of dark, textured, new wavy sound, or dark wave. But, uh, yeah, it's an EP, so it's like six or seven songs. I think it's six songs. And uh, musically, it, yeah, it sounds like a fair amount of the sound on the uh, the Axe, the most recent Axe records, but not as much chamber instrumentation. And it, it was an EP that was recorded for six different fans of the band, one being um, Kevin Perea, who's who's been involved in Hollywood and has really been a huge super fan of the Deer Hunter, helped them out financially. And uh, the vinyl I, that I showed, again, that I haven't showed the video, I showed the booklet and showed all the different songs with those fans at their places. So, But yeah, um, Blame Paradise is one song that's... I've, and they did a video, a very odd, um, quirky video for... Um, but yeah, I, I can't go through all the tracks and everything one of these releases, just even though they've already come out. Maybe I'll do that at a later time. But, um, okay, and so The Faceless in Becoming a Ghost is receiving some criticism, but personally, I really am liking a lot of it. It um, it reminds me, not reminds me of the first album, but the last album, Autotheism, I never got that into, but um, the first Three, there are three songs that were shared before the, the album came out. One a couple years ago, um, The Spiraling Void, is just awesome. Um, very progressive, but um, different in some ways. But, uh, I mean, The Faceless are technical death metal of a sort. Um, what is it? Black Star? And then there's one other song. One of the songs that they shared before the album came out uses a flute solo, which I really liked. So... Um, yeah, this is this is more proggy, I guess, than any of the other Faceless albums in some ways. And the you know people said it just doesn't flow. It, it I don't know. They're being critical of the vocals, um, and it doesn't it doesn't it wasn't really well composed. It's been five like five years since Autotheism, but I, maybe it's been that long since I've listened to the Faceless regular, and that's why this is working for me. But anyway, thumbs up. Like I mentioned, Nicholas Krigovich in an open field, and then the U two songs of experience I've also heard and. Another album that's getting a lot of cr- uh, criticism, um, Songs of Innocence came out like 2014 or 2015, 2014, the one that ended up on everyone's iPhone, if they have an iPhone, I don't have an iPhone, but um, it's a long album, but it's it's uh, kind of refreshingly good. Um, what's the single that, um, oh, what was that about? The single that I... Um, that I ended up, um, I, 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 you know, I thought I'd heard it before, but you know, I, I think it's the among a, a number of songs that could be and probably will end up on the radio. Have they have not already? It's been around for a couple years, um, but I think it's probably the, still the best song on there. But I guess it sounds there's a lot of twists and turns and unexpected energy on this record, and that's why it's working for me. I don't love it. I mean, I don't expect to love it. I'm thinking of da, 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 something that has the word love in it. No, not the blackout. Where is it? Maybe because I have like the deluxe edition. Love is all we have left, maybe? No. Let me see here. Maybe the with the bonus, the one that I ended up checking out had bonus tracks. There it is. And so I actually listened to this with, with a slightly wrong impression. Ordinary Love. Yeah, Ordinary Love didn't end up as a, as a standard track on this. Oh, interesting. Um, anyway, may, that might have been on the last record. I can't remember. One of my one of the people I know on the message boards mentioned, and the guy who does a podcast that I, I really like, the Geeks USA podcast, mentioned that he wishes they would take both Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience and make one record. 
maybe Ordinary Love was on that album. But anyway, American Soul, I think, is the one that has um, uh, Kendrick Lamar. That's the only issue I have. I don't care for Kendrick Lamar. He didn't need to be on that that song. That song, but he's only on the very beginning of it. Um, Let's see here. Ordinary cuz Ordinary Love is terrific. That's one of the best so- U2 songs they've had in recent years. Yeah, I think it was just released as a single cuz I don't look it doesn't look like it was on Songs of Innocence. So, oh well. Anyway, that that's that's it for the U2 album and uh I'm giving it 3 stars at this point. I'm going to revisit it a little bit just to see if that holds up. It's just a long record, but there's there's five or six songs that I was like, "Oh, this is good." I I haven't heard of U2 songs like this. This I haven't been impressed by U2 songs like this in well over 10 years. So, Okay, so December 8th, you had Diablo Swing Orchestra's Pacific, Pacifistif Cuffs. I can't pronounce that word. P-A-C-I-F-I-S-T-I-C-U-F-F-S. Diablo Swing Orchestra, I want to say are from Sweden. I'm not certain about that, but I think they are. They're based on their name. They're, they're sort of a metal band with, with jazz instrumentation at points and uh, sort of at one point operatic vocals not so much with the the singer in the last couple records but it's been a number of years since their last album which starts with a pm f- blanking on the name of it uh, pandora's pinata i think it was but i haven't listened to this record but all indications are people are liking it or they're saying it's more catchy and poppy so the real metal heads and the real prog heads might not be as into it but i'm going to be checking it out this coming week so Today's uh, Saturday, the 9th of, of December. So, And the same day, the Gloomcatcher, yesterday, released their first release in <laughs> almost a little bit longer than Diablo Swingworkers' last album. This is the first release from the Gloomcatcher since 2011, an EP called Blade in the Belfry. And I, I finally gotten to hear the whole thing and maybe call me a Jesse Rabordi slash River Empires and including <laughs> the Gloomcatcher in that window, that umbrella. But this, I'm loving this record. In fact, of all these releases, I would put it number one already, even though I've only heard it like about <laughs> one and a half times. Um, but it's kind of splitting hairs, but I, oh, it's sublime. The first song that they shared um, is is terrific. But I mean, they, the thing I've noticed about this record is they, they do use some of the instrumentation um, that maybe I thought of for the... Um, the River Empires, but let's see if I can find. There it is, right there. Um, I just know I'm going to be listening to this a lot. It's it's only six songs, so that's that also helps. Blade Blade in the Belfry from the Gloomcatcher. Um, let's see here. What was it? The Night's the first song, but um, Kai the Hose, Mar- Marina. Even I mean, it's sublime. It's kind of you know, less is more. It's um, melancholy in some ways, or more just sort of bright and textured. Uh, it's in Jesse Rabordi's voice. I mean, it, I guess you could say it's a little bit like the last Falling Up album, too, the self-titled, which was more stripped down. There aren't a lot of electric. There's a lot of electric guitar on this, which is one thing the River Empires did share with the Gloomcatcher. So, but it's more straight acoustic. Um, but. I don't know, I need to go back and revisit the first Gloomcatcher album and then that EP, Star Lord Over the Fences, just to kind of compare, distinguish between Gloomcatcher, The River Empires, and Falling Up, of course. But, um, yeah, I I mean, part of it is just, it's like when Vinart put out his album. It was just so, I'm just so happy. I was just so happy. It's just a breath of fresh air just to hear something new. Um, Jesse Rabordi has been doing a lot of soundtrack work and everything in the last few years. Uh, for a book or a game and a video game and then a film or two and uh, the hope obviously the hope for the river empire still remains but don't i'm not expecting anytime soon and and then this this other project that he mentioned a few years ago but i don't know if that's what he was doing here or if it's something else so but i know that the guy when he does things really well it, it totally sticks with me and this is no exception so all right, so let's go on to stuff that hasn't been released the rest of this month. Um, I don't actually have anything on my anticipation list currently, oddly enough, which is fine because you're talking about one, two, like the Galactic Cowboys, the Deer Hunter, the Faceless, Nicholas Krigovich, U2, Diablo, Swing Orchestra, and the Gloomcatcher. That's more than enough music to wait until January. And some of the stuff will be found, obviously, earlier than that at points if they share online, that kind of stuff. They stream it. But, okay, so starting in January, we got Typhoon, 
on the 12th. I would figure there might be something the first week of January, the first Friday, but it's not. I have nothing right now for myself. But the 12th, there's two albums, Typhoon Offerings and Umphreys McGee's It's Not Us. The Typhoon album, Offerings, well, their last album came out in 2013, um, White Lighter, was just awesome. It was my top three records of the year. I got the cassette tape, I got the CD, and I got the vinyl. Uh, and it, they're a big chamber ensemble rock band of like 25 people. Uh, they know how to just write textured, uh, layered songs or pieces, emotional pieces. A lot of folk influence, but, you know, you have your xylophone, you have your saxophone, you have your two guitars, three guitars, lots of drums, uh, you know, bass guitar, um, flute, you know, cello, you know, you name it. This And a lot of vocals. Um, there's a 20, the first, it's like in movements and the concept album offerings. It's kind of, I remember reading a little bit about it. It's like if... The, basically, the, it was like uh, post-apocalyptic or, you know, if our current world ended, how, how would we deal with things? But it's uh, the first movement, the first 20 minutes or has been on U- YouTube for like a month and change. And I love it. So I'm uh, really excited for this. I pre-ordered the vinyl and everything. So Umphreys McGee, it's not us. Umphreys McGee, um, every record they put out. I will definitely check out unless we get to a long string of records that don't do anything for me. But uh, ever since Mantis, I've just kind of vowed that I'll be checking out the Umphreys McGee studio albums, even if I don't go back to them much. Uh, because they had Anchor Drop, and then Safety by Numbers was not as good as Anchor Drops, and I kind of wondered about them, but then Mantis blew me away. So, um, But their last few records have been sort of mid-level at best. But I love it when a band, I don't expect it, to put out something great does, and Umphreys McGee has done that before, so we'll see what happens on this record on the 12th. Then on the 19th of January, we have Primal Heart from Kimbra, and this is supposed to be a little more organic, a little more stripped-down Kimbra record, which um, I'm a little skeptical about, as much as I love both of her studio albums. The Golden Echo was obviously different than her debut album, Vows, but and the single she released in the, before this album came out. She's got a producer. I'm forgetting the name of the producer now. But I think her direction was to be a little more... It was not It was trying to do something different, a little more I don't think acoustic, but um, just different, a different approach to songwriting, which I think a lot of the fans are going to probably turn on or are not going to care for it. But the people that are kind of liberal-minded, open-minded, will probably be on board with this and maybe surprised by it. That song, uh, Top of the World, is one of the songs that she shared... And it's, it's a grower, like a lot of her songs are. It's a little different, but it's a grower. Um, some of it sounds ethnic, almost like Japanese, like J-pop, that kind of thing. But anyway, uh, the 26th, there's a uh, January 26th, there's In Vain, has the album Currents. In Vain, the sort of black and progressive death metal band from Norway. I hope I'm getting that correct. Um, they have been a band that I've loved for a long for a number of years almost since, since their debut i'm hearing their debut album uh the latter rain in 2007 and i um i like really like their last record enigma the one before it mantra was good but i think after loving the latter rain their first album i i wasn't as into it but i i think mantra still probably ended up being a pretty good record so they really haven't released a bad record and I kind of look at them as the kind of the, the standard or my favorite of this kind of style of very epic, layered, um, what's the word, cerebral uh, progressive death metal. I mean, they're a new kind of progressive metal that I wish more bands could take from. And probably some have, but they're not that well known, sadly. So I'm up looking forward to Currents. Uh, it's not that far away. And it's been, I think Enigma was in 2013 as well, like, like Typhoon's uh, White Lighter. So it's been four years, four years and change. Um, so I, I assume they took their time on this record. and um, So anyway, then in February, the schedule has Field Mouse, or Field Mouse, Field Music open here on the 2nd, along with Long Distance Calling's Boundless on the 2nd. And while Field Music is a band that I, I'm not huge into, but I, I like, I guess I'm waiting for them to blow me away. They never really have, but they have songs here and there that are quirky enough that I've liked. My biggest issue with some of their records is they're always so long, and there's usually never any clear-cut go-to songs. But um, at the same time, I, you know, I, I I think they're worth checking out, and they're better than some records. I mean, they're, that I, I check out every year that you know I just don't have any interest in. They're a little bit like XTC, and and that's actually kind of a good comparison because XTC they have 
a lot of songs that I just kind of listen to and enjoy, but don't don't like attach to because they're so quirky. Although XCC, they have specific songs that I love. And Field Music, historically, I haven't found too many, unfortunately. But anyway, I still like them, and I'm interested in this record. Um, Long Distance Calling, Boundless, of course, their last record, Trips, was in my, I think it was my top 10 or top 15. I believe it was 2015 that they put out. It was a 2015 or 26. I can't remember which year it was. Uh, I guess they, they, they got rid of the vocals on this one. There's no vocals and um, the previous records before Trips honestly went past me. I loved their second album to death, Avoid the Light. Um, but the records that came out after this, like the self title and there was one other one, I, I don't know, I didn't spend enough time with them or just that they, they sounded like they were doing, they weren't doing the progressive stuff as more of the post rock stuff. When they brought in the singer and the flow of that last record just worked, Trips. But there's no singing on this, so we'll see what this how this one compares. But. Then the uh, the only other confirmed date I've got here is Gleb Kolyadin. Gleb Kolyadin of I Am The Morning on the K-Scope label is releasing a, sel- a self-titled debut album. Just came out. I just saw the, the information yesterday. Um, and it features Steve Hogarth on one of the songs, of course, with Marillion, and um, a few other people. Gavin Harrison, I believe, the drummer, former drummer of Porcupine Tree and King Crimson and everything like that. Um, and members of Stephen Wilson's band, Nick Beggs. Oh, Jordan Rudis, I believe, is on here, which is weird because Gleb is a piano player. Of course, Jordan plays keys and piano. But um, I'm curious about it, but I'm not expecting ama- anything amazing. But I'm curious about it. I mean, the the involvement of, of Harrison and... I mean, Hogarth is probably only on the one song, but um, we'll see if, if, you know, how it compares to I In The Morning, how different it is to I In The Morning's music. So, so all right. Um, we're at 21 minutes here. I'll, um, yeah, let me just kind of go down the, the list here as quickly as I can. Um, confirmed titles, The there's about, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I got nine listed here. The biggest being Ours is a Spectacular Sight, which was supposed to come out last year, and unfortunately the, the guy who was supposed to mix it, uh, we never finished mixing it, passed away, he had cancer. Um, hopefully it comes out, maybe it's a trackless thing, maybe it's... They need to someone have someone finish mixing. I'm not sure. Jimmy is is they usually he sends out Jimmy Neckler sends out an email every year to talking about um you know uh, what, what an update on everything and uh, what's going on with ours and his touring and um and I I don't know I guess I think we should get one on the email list if not on so, social media as well um, but I kind of just kind of think he's taking his time and not wanting to put this out in a rushed way. Even though the music's already been written, unless he's got some new music, he wants to wants to release it in a different way. I don't know, so um, I hope it comes out next year. But we'll see. I guess I with ours, they're such a special band to me. You know, anything is anything is fine. They put out the three song sampler that I loved, um, but you know, it was only three songs and it wasn't really the full album. So, um, Joey Appard's "Word to the Wise." Tears for Fears, The Tipping Point, Judas Priest's Firepower, and yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to be end up listening to that, because um, I'm not that much of a Judas Priest fan. Fish's last album, Welch Schmertz, hopefully that comes out. Um, Fish from formerly Marillion, of course. Chromio's Head Over Heels, Sheik's It's About Time, and then Antimask's Saddle on the, Saddle on the Atom Bomb. You know, I mean, the Fish album, and Joey Eppard's especially, I will want to hear. I will hear the Chromio album just because the wife will be talking about it when it comes out. Um, Tears for Fears, I'll check out. I re- recently heard some Roland, or Zabal, or whatever his name is, solo music. Really liked. Oh, and Sculpture. Did I mention that? Maybe I forgot that. Sculpture, The Liminal Phase. That's the, probably the second biggest anticipated release on here. Because I've been waiting for a new Sculpture record since 2008. You know, obviously. Uh, Don Anderson of Agaloc. The Agaloc's not a, a band anymore, so Don Anderson's doing other things, and this is one of one of his past projects so all right so that's that for confirmed titles then we have likely tight likely artists they're going to release an album it's just that the, the all the details of that hasn't come out yet so barren earth you know i don't know if i've ever even listened to a full barren earth album but i know them they're like a black metal band uh, maybe like a thrashy black metal band i can't remember maybe like they're kind of like vector i mean I, I may be a bad comparison but um 
Anyway, Ben Sinister, totally excited for that, of course. Love the EP. And in fact, they just released a remastered version of their first proper full length through the Broken City with the EP as a special. It's on, on a discounted rate. Between the Buried and Me, my stance has been for a few years now with Between the Buried and Me. We'll check it out. Not high hopes, though, unfortunately. Flying Colors, my, one of Mike Portnoy's many projects. I'm kind of in that same vein, although they only have two albums under their belt. I'd like to see Flying Colors focus more on pop and not as much on prog, but we'll see. Um, it, it may just, and also the fact Neil Morris is involved. It'd be nice at least if Neil Morris did a little less singing. We just basically have Casey McPherson doing all the vocal, almost all the vocals, but I don't, or just have harmonies. No lead vocals from Neil Morris, but we'll see. Um, for the Imperium, yeah, that record, the kind of ex- very Faith No More, Mr. Bungle Influence band um, from Iceland, somewhere in the kind of that area, <laughs> my my eastern like northern Europe um, geography and memory, but yeah. I, they're an, a quirky band, but they have written some really catchy songs, as odd as they sound. It's, they almost get come off as cheesy, but they end up working for me. And they actually, I get earworms from them. It's weird. Um, Gortia, yes. She's talked to Kimber in a Kimber interview. She's mentioned he was working on a record while she was working on her record. Um, we'd love to see the next record. The last album from The Basics, I didn't care for, but... Um, I, I thought some some thought he had retired, but apparently he may not have. So, but uh, you know that that album with uh, somebody that I, that I used to know, of course, came out in 2011. Yeah, it was 2011. It's been that long, so so it'll be seven years this in 2018. Image and Heap also been a number of years since 2014. I think it was the last Kimber record that came out the same year. Um, but she's she definitely going to release singles. I don't know. She seems to release a lot of singles as opposed to full-length records and using technology. And she's touring, but I don't know if the tour is coming here. And the pre-order tickets are through the roof, unfortunately. Lato and Wright, excited for that. If it comes out, it's been like five years since their last full-length record. And Anyway, live, they've gotten back together. I don't know. Unless that came out in 2017, I didn't see it. Um... But I'm not a huge live fan, but I'll check it out. Janelle Monet, of course, she's been busy in Hollywood doing acting, but before she had a bunch of these gigs, she was working on her next record, and so maybe she'll find the time this year to do that. Although, December, this month, she's going to be in at least one episode of the um, Phil K. Dick adapted thing on Amazon Prime, which I will be able to see, thankfully, I think, um, Electric Dreams, which is kind of based on that Electric Robots, Dream of Electric Sleep, you know. I was thinking about that band, Dream the Electric Sleep. <laughs> but yeah, Janelle Monáe and Brian Cranston, some other people, I'm looking forward to seeing her in that, but I hope her next record comes out soon because it's been, it'll be five years since um, The Electric Lady in 2013. Uh, Native Construct, looking for the, forward to the sophomore effort from them, the progressive metal band that's on Metal Blade Records. Um, Never Any White Lights, totally excited and I, this i it sounds like D- daniel's really being serious this time i mean he's a perfectionist just don't lose anything daniel but um it's been five years it'll be six years since uh act was it act three yeah act three um but yeah and i'm not sure it's even going to be called never any white lights but we'll see uh, i love never any white lights or a special band like the river empires or even the gloom catcher if something comes out from them i totally am on board and excited for it uh, melancholy pop rock folk textured new wavy kind of stuff with progressive elements um with different singers i'm not sure if this particular release that comes out from them will have different singers though that may be the one distinction it may just be daniel victor doing all the singing uh the reign of kindo of course i've heard something like 11 or 12 of the new songs through the patreon program over the last year and change and the last one was just amazing poor hungry kings or whatever it's called um, this uh, I would almost say if even more than half of the songs I've already heard the Patreon uh, from the Patreon end up on this new record, which will be coming out sometime in like February, March, sometime in the the, the winter or spring, it's according to what they said they projected when I saw them live. I talking to one of the the guys behind the merch booth. Um, if this comes out, it's album of the year contender by default. <laughs> because <laughs> I am a fanboy and, and all the songs they've released basically everyone I might like so anyway The Rain of Kendo definitely should people should be looking forward to this record uh, coming out sometime probably in the first half of the year 
finally. And then they're going to continue with the Patreon with, for their next record. Maybe just be their whole new way of doing things, which I totally understand for a band I love. It's a band I'm not that into. I don't know if I would be as supportive. Like Some other bands have done that, I know. Um, the Sea Within, uh, this is a... a I wouldn't call it a super group that they're calling a super group, but it's a new project from Daniel Gillen, of course, a Pain of Salvation, and used to be with the Flower Kings, and uh, Ron Assault from the Flower Kings, and uh, Jonas Reingold from the Flower Kings, I believe it is, and then uh, Tom Brislin, who played with Yes and Renaissance, and his own band Spiraling, and I guess he has a solo album that came out back in 2012 that I, I, I'm about to check out, actually. And then the drummer is Marco Miniman. So a lot of talent in this group, that still doesn't mean that the songwriting is going to be, you know, dramatically better, good, or whatever. It's going to be good, but and they're calling it more like art rock or art pop. Um, I hope it's different, but I hope it's different in a good way. I don't want anything like the Michael Ackerfeld, Stephen Wilson project, which I'm blanking on the name of right now. Um, let me just Google that just so I don't have to leave people hanging. Um, which ended up being like Scott Walker influence. Um, let's see here. I forget that. Why? Well, I mean, that, that's how memorable it was. And storm corrosion, which was talked about for years, the two of them working together. You know, I mean, this hasn't been talked about for years. Working together, having Daniel rejoin the Flower Kings, working with Ron Estold again. But um, I, I'd like it to be different, but not so dramatically different that I'm just, you know. <laughs> it's so avant-garde. I don't know if the people in this band really would be likely to make music like that, though. But I also don't... I hope it's not like your pure prog. Uh, I didn't even check out Sons of Apollo, actually, after hearing some of the, the singles. So, you know, just because you have certain names doing music together doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sound any different than you expect, any better than you expect, or any worse than you expect. It's really... I hope the fact that Gildemo is going to be involved in the songwriting specifically and hopefully a lot of the lead vocals will make somewhat of a difference on how much this sounds like retro prog rock. I hope it ends up sounding more like soundtrack music or something. I don't know. We'll see. Shelter Red, post-metal, post-rock band from Portland. The last record I was all excited for, and I, I can't say I loved it that much. Their, the previous two records I did like, though. So, and I, you know, I'm, I'm glad they have a new record coming, but I'm not going to get all up, up for it. Soundscape, on the other hand, as much as it, as it is sort of almost uh, understandable recipe, progressive rock or heavy progressive metal or heavy progressive rock, whatever, I have too much of a nostalgic and um, obsession with them <laughs> to, like, not have high hopes for it. It's their first newly written album um, since really since the end of the, the 90s, because the, the record they released, uh, Grave New World, in 2009 was all music that was written and recorded back in the late 90s. So um, I'm hoping that some of the influence, some new influence may come in. If it's prog metal, their kind of prog metal I like, but I guess <laughs> the last Enchant album I was not happy with, and I didn't love, unfortunately. I could say the same thing about. Now, I'll compare that to the Galactic Cowboys album, and I'm really loving that record, so we'll see. I mean, if it ain't bro broke, don't fix it. But um, just I just hope the performances are good. And if it ends up being an album of the year candidate, I won't shock because obviously Grave New World was, and I end up listening to it a lot. So, but at the same time, I guess I after the Enchant experience, you know, there's the, you can't assume anything, especially since they haven't written new music together in so long. Um, but again, Galactic Cowboys, <laughs> what happened? Esperanza Spalding, this project where she streamed and recorded, wrote and recorded, basically, at least wrote, uh, and streamed it for 77 hours. Um, I think it's going to be called Exposure. I should put that in there. But, um, yeah, I'm, I like Esperanza Spalding's last album a lot. and I haven't fully dissected or digested her whole back catalog. But, I mean, I, I you know... I'm not a huge fan, although without a Janelle Monae album in the last few years, uh, having her music come come into my playlist has really helped. And the stuff I heard on while watching some of the stream, I spent maybe a, three, four hours watching the stream for the, the four or five days it was done. It was like four days. Um, yeah, it was a lot of it was catchy. A lot of it was, of course, jazzy and funky at points. Uh, very melodic. So I'm hoping for some good things. And I know, oh, man, one of the guys, Andrew Bird was involved. But there's a lot of other people involved with it, so we'll see who... Maybe maybe Janelle's involved with it, just like the way that... Uh, it would be post-production, though, or something like that, but... 
The way that she ended up on the last Chanel Monet album. Spock's beard. Um, prog rock, of course. I assume this is without was with Ted Leonard and the, the current lineup. I like the first le- record with Ted Leonard more than the second one, but Nocturne something sleep. I forget the name of it. But check it out. You know, a lot of people have high hopes for them. Um, I guess I'm just kind of... I have more optimism about this than the Neil Moore stuff, sadly, though. Tiny Giant, which is the um, project from Chloe Alper and the guy from Cooper Tempo Claws, which I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I've uh, been waiting for the full-length debut album for them for quite a while. For like the last two-plus years, and really anything post purism Revolution from Chloe as a full-length for four or five years. Um, the singles they've released have been good. Not amazing, but it's it's pop music. But it's like you know, like Kimbra kind of in a way. Although I don't know, it's I don't know if it's quite as kind of diverse as Kimbra. But um, we'll see. Future pop or future rock. Pop means future rock or whatever the phrase they use. The you know. But I'm looking forward to it. I want want to see more music from Chloe. Of course, I loved her in Pure Reason Revolution. So and then a slightly related band, Vinart, Mike Vinart of Ocean, performing of Ocean Size. And British, currently a British theater and uh, touring guitarist for Biffy Clyro has his second full-length album, which might end up being a double album, or there may be two albums. Um, but yeah, that that is definitely coming out because he finished writing it, if not recording a lot of it. Uh, he put a, posted an update like a month ago or like three weeks ago. So, and Dima Joke was my favorite, my third favorite record in 2015. So. I have very high hopes for this, rightfully so. And the guy really can't do anything bad. And you know, Ocean Size and you know his solo work and British Theater I like too. I you know not quite as much, but so if the Vinart's uh, album ends up in the top five, I will not be surprised. Maybe I'm a little bit of a fanboy, of course, too. So the speculation hope. Cause I'm looking here. Where is the Family Crest? They're not on my list. That which is just weird. Um, I'll just go through this list. Bruce Peninsula. Chroma Key, Disillusion, East of the Wall, um, East of the Wall, I'm looking forward to it. Fiacre, of course, and Pepe Deluxe, those are the two biggies. Uh, Jazz Kamikaze, Journal, Carnival, people have been waiting a long time. It's the last album in 2013. There's a lot of people that love Carnival. I was on board probably before a lot of them, but I haven't been as into them as some people. But we don't have Fair to Midland anymore. Fair, uh, Carnival, the kind of a the closest thing to that and i'm glad they're still making music but they're just taking their time um the red paintings of course their last record was my album of the year even though the production still bugs me um i don't know if jesse Rabordi will have his actual project that he's mentioned besides the gloomcatcher stuff coming out next year it might who knows if, if the gloomcatcher album is what he was referring to when he mentioned that sicker rose system of a down um, but just looking at this, I'm surprised the Family Crest aren't on here, and they need to get added because the Family Crest are another one that they put out the EP, of course, in 2017, and their last album, Beneath the Brian, was amazing. Their next album is I can totally see being awesome, having tons of guests and tons of instrumentation, much like the Typhoon record. At least we have Typhoon coming out uh, for sure. But I um, I know it's some kind of war concept and. I'm really thinking that uh, if it comes out, or maybe more than one album, it's going to be another massive, you know, project. So um, I'm looking at this list. Is there anything else? Not really. So, well, the Guns and Roses and Tool thing. There was a report from I don't know Danny Carey or something that was posted today saying that Tool, Tool's album will come out in 2018. But we've heard that how many times? Boy, Cry Wolf or whatever. You know, people are saying they won't believe it until they actually have it in their hands. Guns N' Roses and Tool, though, are two bands I wouldn't be buying. I'd have to really read a lot of hype about it to even check them out. I mean, I probably would check out the Tool album, but I've I've said it many times before, and I'm I'm not a Tool fan, really. Not much of a Tool fan because I used to get headaches trying to listen to their music. So, um, But yeah, that's a reminder. I need to add the Family Crest to this list. There's probably some other names I'm not remembering. Because I, I wanted to strip it down and really get the essentials for what was coming out, rather than just have just this long laundry list that I always have, uh, that you know, thirty percent or more of the stuff never even comes out or comes out four years later. So, um, but the Family Crest are touring with the Deer Hunter. They put out the EP in 2017, which is just a, a sampler, really supposed to be of what they're going to be putting out. I've, having seen them live and talked to the members, this new project, if it's called War or whatever it's called, is going to be big and it will come out. It's just a matter of whether it comes out in 2018, 2019, we don't know. The same could be said about the River Empires and 
and even the Pepe Deluxe and Fiaco records, which I've been waiting for for many years now. So, but thank you for listening. Thank you for tolerating my babbling if you made it this far. <laughs> and uh, like I said, I want to try to do these maybe every quarter, if not maybe every every at least half. I'll do a mid-season list of albums. Um, but I also will do uh, an anticipation list for the rest of the year just to update it, uh, as I do in the blog. And I'm really trying to be religious about updating this entry. Like, I've done, like, a post one entry and then update it two times, and then it just gets buried. Just so it can be remain current throughout the, as much of the year as possible. So, But uh, thanks for listening. Uh, please comment, like, and subscribe. And also, please, I should have mentioned this first, add any albums that you are anticipating that I didn't talk about. And, and comment about obviously the ones I did talk uh, already mentioned, but add any albums that you're anticipating. What are your biggest three, five, or ten albums or more uh, coming out in 2018? And thank you for listening. See you next time. Bye.